All right. So welcome to the second installment of dreaming of a new collections or dreaming of a new collections management system. And thank you for joining our discussion today. Uh, for those who haven't joined in our previous webinar, my name is Alex Cron, and I am moderating these webinars on behalf of the Balboa Park Online Collaborative, or BPOC. Um, I am BPOC's Digital Projects and Collections Specialist. So for those who have not attended our previous webinar, our first session we had last month, and we were discussing the challenges around managing collections data and collections management systems from the perspective of a, a consultant. Today's webinar, we will, uh, well, our discussion will revolve around the experiences and challenges faced by those working in cultural institutions. So before we get started, I would like to introduce our panelists. Uh, so today we have, and panelists, you may unmute yourselves and give a little hello when I introduce you. Um, Today we have Renee Baumgartner, who has almost three decades experience working with collections management systems. Presently, she is the collections information manager at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, or PMA, which houses an encyclopedic collection of 240,000 objects. Prior to joining the PMA, she was the first full-time registrar at the Barnes Foundation and implemented their collections management system and developed data standards. Renee has presented at Gallery Systems Collective Imagination Conferences. She holds a Master's in American Studies from the Pennsylvania State University and a Bachelor's in Historic Preservation with an emphasis in Museum Studies from Southeast Missouri State University. Next. Good morning, Good morning everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next, we have Jody Evans, who was originally hired to move the museum collection has been registrar with the State Historical Society of Iowa since 1990. She holds a bachelor's in political science, a master's in United States history, and is a graduate of the American Association for State and Local History Leadership Institute. Jody finds being a registrar is the perfect job for her as it involves list making, problem solving, problem solving making order out of chaos, and fre frequently getting to say, I told you so. Hello. Next, we have Jeff Stewart. For over 20 years, Jeff has worked at museums with museum data. He's spent that time working on the fundamental interconnectedness of all things at two major art museums in the greater Boston area, Museum of Fine Art, Boston, and Harvard Art Museums. His areas of research include visualization of cultural data sets, open access to institutional records, data interop interoperability and sustainability, and developing tools for making art fun, accessible, and enjoyable. Morning, everyone. Afternoon, evening. Now, representing the BPOC team today, we have Neil Stimler. Neil is a consulting executive advisor with BPOC and the president of Stimler Advantage, an executive management consulting firm. Neil brings interdisciplinary vision to your boardroom. He empowers today's leaders to lead and regularly advises clients and cultural institutions on innovative practices in data, databases, and digital asset and enterprise content management. Neil guided the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Smithsonian Institution to implement their open access programs. At the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Neil developed data and digital asset content development policy and strategy for museum collections, open access, time-based media, and wearable technology. He has designed comprehensive workflows, written documentation, and provided user training and collaboration with internal and external stakeholders. Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, very happy to see uh, friends joining us as well. So thank you for your interest and support. Yes, all right. So now we'll go ahead and get started. And why don't we start off with you, Renee? Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what it is that you do at your institution and some of the challenges that you face in managing your collections data? All right. thanks, Alex. And thanks once again for everybody joining and taking the time today. Um, I reached out to Alex after last month's recording because I found it to be very interesting to hear um, 
the side of consultants talking about it. So this is kind of the flip side, the users um, sharing what they find about collections management systems. Um, at the PMA, it is, um, it's the largest institution that I've ever worked at. It's a collection, as I said, with 240,000 objects spanning nine different curatorial departments. So you'll have some curatorial departments that have less than a thousand objects and you have other ones that have close to 160,000 objects. So that would be our prints, drawings, and photograph department. Um, so there's always challenges when you're looking for this, you know, to get nine different departments who all think that they are special and have unique cataloging needs and kind of get them all into one system. So it's been, um, prior to being in the collection information manager role, I was the data standards person and it was really about working with all of the users, training them, communicating with them why it was important that we all not have nine exceptions because we all have to use the same similar um, database. So that has been a really a challenge and I think it's been critical in overcoming some of those challenges and then having conversations with staff to understand why it's important. Um, we've also taken the time to look at how fields have been used not just to put it in the field because it's on the front and you can see it. Let's put it in the field where the data actually belongs as opposed to, hey, I like it here because I can see it and it's visually pleasing to me. Um, because as we know, if you have dirty data, you can't do anything with it. And obviously since, you know, last March, the world has changed and collection information on the web and how we're publishing out has really, um, jump to the forefront. So sharing our collections has been paramount. And I think it's opening people's eyes to see that, hey, we can't do certain things because our data doesn't look so good. Um, I think one of the reasons that I reached out to Alex also too, is that I wanted to talk about, you know, these four kind of pillars, you know, you have training who, once you get that collections management system, who does the training? Is it, you know, you're going back to the vendor or, or do you have somebody on staff that's doing that formalized training and then creating the documentation and finding out what your workflows are in your institution? Um, the other thing is that's really important is ownership. Who, who or what department is taking ownership of the collection management system? Because if you don't have a champion of this, then your institution, it's not going to be a priority and then people are not going to get on board and it's, it's not going to be seen as something that they can utilize as a tool and benefit them. I constantly am telling the curators, I'm here to make them look good, you know, give me the data and I can make you look good. Um, I'm just in the background. So to let them to shine, so to speak. The other thing that's really important, I think, is that a lot of us have come to these roles in different ways. So some of us have actually gone, and when I think about that, like have gone to school for museum studies. So you might have your registrars, your collection managers, and your conservators who have that educational background with a collections management system and they understand data standards and why information is put in certain fields. But then you have your curators who have a history or a science background or an art history background and they haven't been trained on cataloging so there's the challenge there they're just really into researching what they are in charge of in that collection another key aspect is skills you know the registrars who or the collection managers who are in charge of these collections management system have to have technical skills so have they learned SQL? Are they learning HTML, um, SSRS, Crystal Reports, and API? You know, the list, the alphabet soup of that goes on. And then there's also the knowledge, the flip side of that is the cataloging. Are you using the AAT, the TGN? Are you using CDOC? Is it Lido? Is it Dublin Core? Is it MARC? You know, and, and so forth. So those are, that's a whole other particular skill set and knowledge to have. Um, and it just, you know, I think that institutions and leadership needs to know that. And there's some institutions, whether you're a large institution like the one that I work at, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, 
or you're a small historical society, you're going to have different needs. And people need to know that, you know, one collections management system is not going to fit everybody's and you have different limitations like technical skills, you have monetary issues. So you really, I don't know, think one size fits all. Um, and I'm a firm believer that, you know, one's collections management system is only as good as you make it. You need to have that foundation and without having that foundation, then you can't realistically do any of those other kind of projects that sometimes people come up with, whether it's the leadership or it's a curator or maybe it's a volunteer. So those are some of the issues that I wanted to raise about for as a user's perspective with having the collections management system. I'm sure we could talk on each one of those things separately, but um, that's what I just wanted to bring to the table and raise some issues today. Um, and I've used to have the experience of working with four different collections management systems over my years. And when I first started, it was with Argus and it was DOS based. So it, we have, you know, the CMSs have changed technically, maybe not as quickly as other technology, but maybe it's going at the, the pace museums go at and which is usually at a glacier pace. So we have to maybe keep that in mind. Great. Thank you for that, Renee. Um, and I did forget to mention at the meeting that if you want to contribute to this conversation, please feel free to add any discussion points or questions that you have in the chat and we will address those um, after the panel has all had a chance to speak. So, Jody, why don't we hear what, from your perspective now? Hello, everyone. Um, just a little bit about my institution. It is the State Historical Society of Iowa. And our um, goal was to, A, integrate all collection information across three professionally managed collections, library, archives, and museum. And also to have a robust and um, efficient and usable online portal to those collections. So we started this journey in 2015, um, a, a little bit more. Uh, the museum has 96,000 objects that we know about in its collection and the library and archives combined have about 2.9 million pages of materials. So we needed something that would, that would handle a lot of information. We wanted a, a CMS that would address the professional needs of all of the collections. Uh, the last thing we wanted was to have one collection shoehorned into a, a, a CMS developed by another collection type. So archival materials could be cataloged into the museum, into a museum type CMS, but we did not want to do that. One of the things we noticed in going through the, um, the process, we, we wrote an RFP, we wrote a, a grant for funding. But one of the things we found out in our research was the lack of content or CMS vendors who could handle and address the needs of all the collections, not just um, library archives and museum, but also within the museum collection. Some systems could handle art, but not natural history, or some could handle, um, you know, art and and uh, social history objects, but not architecture, because we have historic sites to deal with. Also, so we found a lack of. Uh, to me, a surprising lack of uh, vendor uh, capability in that search. Again, the the overriding the overriding purpose for for going into this this integrated collection information CMS journey was that we wanted our patrons and our constituents and anybody who came to to you know visit us to be able to find A, what they were looking for and possibly find things they didn't know they were looking for. We wanted that across the board discovery and, and, and joy that you can get when you fall down rabbit holes on the internet. Once we, once we sent, once we developed the request for proposal and sent it out, 
I was expecting there to be five to seven responses, and, and I felt that we could get a good pool of, of um, vendors from that, but unfortunately only three came back. We only, we only have three to look at. One of those was, was fishing for new business opportunities. One of them was um, a recognized museum type content management system that was not adequate for the library or the archives. And the last one blew us away with their response. They were, they were capable and ready to go at the drop of a hat for everything we needed the CMS to do. Um, I, I'll tell you, it's Manisis Inc. out of Vancouver. Um, the only drawback is that it's very pricey. And so um, we've had to deal with that issue as we go through this, this journey. Once we had our vendor online and we had gone through um, uh, introductions and, and talks with them, the other challenge we found was getting other staff to buy into this idea of an integrated collection information system. I was surprised at the level of antipathy that, that came through from some staff members, but I realized it, it came from a place of actually professionalism. They were, they were so good at working with the legacy and the legacy systems and the outdated systems that we had in place that they were wary of switching to a new uh, content management system and losing that efficiency, losing that responsiveness to our, con our constituents. Um, and so there was, there, was a lot, there was a lot to overcome in showing staff individually and collectively that this new system would actually help them and that the learning curve wasn't as steep as they thought it would be. I, you know, hand in the air, I, I, I felt that way too. I built some of our, our collection management databases from, from, ground, from the ground up, and I was wary of giving up my authority over those, those systems. But, you know, once I got over myself, I'm, I'm, I like the new system. It does more than I could do by myself. Um, the other thing we had to deal with is uh, change. You know, people say change is hard, which is a, a statement I really disagree with, that change in itself is not hard. It's change management that is usually done poorly. And, and um, yeah, looking back, 20, hindsight is 2020. We could have done some things. We could have talked more. We could have uh, listened more. We could have... Um, managed the change better rather than just ripping away old legacy systems and plopping a new CMS into people's laps and saying, here it is. We also, um, we migrated in, in uh, order of readiness. The museum was running past perfect. So we had our collection information in, in hand and ready to migrate. The library and archives were running everything from individual access databases and Excel spreadsheets to um, there were some collections that were still on Dewey Decimal card catalog index cards. So there was a lot of work that needed to be done to bring those up to speed in order to migrate. Each one of the collections is now in our new CMS um, with, with varying degrees of success. We will get better. Um, we are still on a journey to integrate our workflow and our new culture in the organization. Um, 2020 and the pandemic kind of put a kink in that in those plans. But I think we will regroup and, and start, start um, talking about and acting as a integrated workflow and culture rather than just three collections that are using the same system. The takeaway the takeaway that I took, that I got from this process was look to your people for both good and, and for uh, negative reactions. Some people will be wildly enthusiastic about it. Some people will not. 
find out why those people are not enthusiastic, and then you can maybe mitigate some of the speed bumps along the way. Also look to your people for who can manage this project. Not all collection adjacent titles are suited for managing a, a project of this magnitude. Sometimes the project manager could come from someplace completely outside of your collection staff. But look to your people. Do a little, do a little homework up front on who, who can best navigate your institution through this swamp, apparently. Um, and the other thing is look at your look at your available and current collection information. What do you have to do to get ready for a new digital age? Do you have to do a lot of transcription? Do you have to do a lot of um, uh, mapping or combining fields so that they map better? Look at the state of your collection information and plan for changing it, upgrading it, transcribing it, whatever you need to do to get it in a place where it can be migrated and, and usable in your new system. Um, I think that's it for me. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Jerry. You had some excellent advice that I know would have been helpful for me in previous collections <laughs> positions. Me too. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so Jeff, now it's your turn to share from your perspective. Okay, yes, thanks again for organizing this uh, discussion. Uh, I have uh, endless thoughts to share on collections management systems, so I'll try to rein it in. Uh, my standard disclaimer before uh, talking about some of the work I do and the museums I work for um, is just to make sure everyone is clear when I say everything I have to say is based on experience at art museums specifically. So if I don't qualify the term museum, it's safe to assume I'm talking about art museums. Uh, okay, so during my 20 odd years of work, I've spent lots of time like everyone else on this panel wandering and waiting deep in museum data, you know, at times marveling at the sparseness and at other times overwhelmed by the noise. Um, and, you know, as many or most of you have experienced, a lot of the data I've spent time with took form of SQL databases, FileMaker databases, flat files ranging from tabular JSON XML to spreadsheets to the occasional PowerPoint file treated as a catalog. Um, a lot of times I spend, I've spent uh, with data expresses images and sound and code and 3D point clouds and whatnot. Um, and these days I spend a lot more time uh, with data as JSON. Um, and I've written software to support internal museum workflow, APIs to provide global public access and policies to govern preservation management access and flow of all this information. Um, and so I, where I like to spend most of my time is pushing at the edges and trying to bend collections data into new forms, trying to get colleagues to say things like, gee, I didn't know our data could do that or answer that type of question. Um, right, so everything to follow is based on lots of, that I have to say is based on lots of observation coupled with direct experience. Um, so I have one broad sweeping statement to share with you, um, which dovetails with some of the things you've already heard. Um, maybe you'll agree, maybe you won't, let's discuss, um, but there is no one cano canonical museum. Museums are a product of their culture, not a product of their objects. And museums at their heart are collections of stories, stories which are rooted in the objects. Um, so I took the title of this webinar series a bit literally and did some deep dreaming about collections management systems. I'm not gonna tell you about day-to-day -day stuff at HAM. Um, I'm just gonna tell you about what I've been dreaming of. Um, so, you know, I dreamt of a world of ubiquitous computing where making notes about the condition of an object is as simple as calling out, you know, hey, CMS, add a condition note to object 2020.123, lower right corner of painting shows wear patterns of unknown origin. And while you're at it, annotate the primary image with that information. And I've dreamt of a world where glasses on my face see the world for me, passively talking to our CMS as I roam the museum building so that when I walk in a storage room and it calculates the amount of available storage in my line of sight and suggests actions I might take. Hey Jeff, there are four paintings in the hold room that, that would fit the space, you wanna move them there? And off we go. Um, so I thought of many non-visual interfaces that would let us keep our hands free for working with objects and not at keyboards. Uh, 
for me at least, it turns out it's relatively easy to think of ways in which our lives with CMSs could be improved if we could get the interface out of the way and just have a conversation with the system. What if we could just tell it our stories and in turn let it, let it tell you some stories back? I think we'd all be a bit happier. So then I thought a bit more about what I personally would want from a new CMS and I landed on a few specific things. Uh, number one, um, possibly the most important, which is why it's number one, I want a CMS that makes public access and institutional transparency an imperative. The system that makes public access the default uh, in which the museum pros using the system have to opt out and with reason. Um, which also raises a lot of uh, separate lines of thought, which is what does public access mean to you in the first place? Um, separate conversation. Uh, so the second, the second thought I've had about CMSs is, is one I've been working on for many years, uh, which is I want a system that could tell me at any point in time if our collections are earning their keep. Um, it's not cheap to house collections. Uh, how can we prove their value um, other than stating with us some scholarly authority that these things do indeed have value? Um, how much uh, does it cost for the air handling to like keep things in a nice cool environment? Uh, what is that, what is that uh, square footage cost? Um, so on and so on. Again, there's a se separate line of questioning there is like, what does value even mean to you? Separate conversation. A third, third thing that I would like from a CMS. I want a CMS that respects each user's perspective. It works with the user to map their experience into the system. The system respects the uniqueness of every contribution, but does not diminish this. But at the same time, works with you to ensure you adhere to the principles of the business, a somewhat a symbi symbiotic relationship. Again, going back to that notion of uh, letting people's expertise flourish. Um, and giving them ways to interact with the system that lets it do it closer to on their terms, but still aligns with what the mission is of your institution. Uh, then, then my fourth thought, which is perhaps the most mundane sounding of, of all of them, is I want a collections management system that our director will use freely without hesitation, where they can answer questions about the business, a system of which they can ask questions about the business and feel confident that the answers they get back are accurate and don't require a team of collections data specialists to decipher and interpret what they're seeing. Um, I don't think these things are unreasonable and I think they're a lot, they're achievable. Uh, it, it, I think they're achievable, um, but of course, um, it's going to take some, some uh, change uh, wrapped in, in considerate change management. Um, so, uh, okay, so why am I even having these thoughts? Uh, well, in part, because I've long held the belief that our collections data is more valuable than the collections themselves. Um, and, and again, that value really does come from the stories and experiences with, with objects. And if we don't document and preserve and provide access to those stories, the objects might as well have not existed. Um, and you know, sub thought there is that we are just in a constant battle uh, with time and entropy, uh, with 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 you know a good majority of the objects that we choose to to keep. The complementary belief here is that all art is performance art, and if we could switch to our mindset there, that might actually give us some clue to how we reframe the question of what is a collections management system. But again, that's another idea to explore at another time. Um, how might we achieve some of this stuff? Uh, and one key way that I that I grapple with all the time is that I think we need to change our thinking and downplay the significance of the object itself and focus on systems that capture the fuzzier things, the fluidity of cataloging art, the culture, the mindset and opinion uh, that swirl around uh, the items, um, all coupled, yet still coupled with the authoritative immutable facts that we, we all uh, know and love. By, um, And how, how else might we achieve this? Uh, by creating uh, systems with many points of entry, by creating systems that are not, again, not object-centric, systems where we treat all aspects of the business as, as equal players and as first-class citizens. Uh, we, we uh, I don't wanna say deprioritize, but we, we, we build systems that are, that are, that again, treat all kinds of work throughout um, museums 
as top tier, not just curators and objects. Another way we might go about achieving some of this is by creating systems that provide immediate feedback for each individual comp contributor. I think, again, this some dovetails with what some of what Renee and Jody have said. Uh, so, you know, imagine if as you entered the most mundane datum, you saw your contribution in the context of the work of one, two, three, or a dozen of your colleagues throughout disparate departments. Or if you saw how your contribution is used to answer other people's questions, how might you change your thinking about the CMS if you had a holistic view and saw the impact of your work more readily, not 12 interfaces removed somewhere on the corners of the web that, uh, you know, no one necessarily visits. Why might we want to do some of this? In part because our institutions are interrogated from an increasing number of perspectives through the lens of donors, money, history. Um, they're interrogated by artists, students, scholars, social media influencers, tourists, algorithms, and bots. Um, more and more uh, points of view are, are coming at our collections and uh, it's, uh, it becomes increasingly important that we do do uh, do more work to um, to build bridges there, and sort of my my big statement here related to that is is largely because art museums strive to be institutions where all are welcome and and all belong, but our systems don't yet encourage that openness. Go back to the, you know uh, public access as an imperative and default, and I'm just going to leave. Uh, end with just a few of some current challenges, which really, again, dovetail with, with um, a lot that you've already heard. Um, it's one of the current challenges, ongoing challenges, always, is always getting colleagues to see past the here and now. And again, see back to my comment about providing more meaningful for feedback for the users who are in our CMSs. Uh, other current challenges, um, also include, you know, because many of our institutions are still in a transition state where the mindset of colleagues is not necessarily digital first. Um, and sort of last, last point being, you know, museums are still inherently reactionary. After all, we're chock full of historians looking to make sense of the past, only contending with the present and future um, at times when forced to, you know, a lot of us has, have gotten better at that, but again, the default tends to be um, dealing with the past and not necessarily the present. Um, it's, we're, we're, we're working to address that collectively. So again, lots of broad thoughts on what I would like to see CMSs become, many which I believe are truly achievable. Uh, and I, again, would love to have additional uh, conversation with all of you about uh, how we can make some of this happen. So I'm going to stop there for now. Thanks for listening. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that. Um, and we do have some great discussion going in the chat right now. And I, I see a few questions. And again, uh, I'll just reiterate that we will go over those at the end. Um, so thank you for the contributions. Um, so next we have, not certainly least of all, we have Neil. <laughs> Great, well, uh, thanks everyone. And I'm really glad to be joining uh, Renee and Jody and Jeff and Alex on this conversation with you today. Uh, I have, as Alex mentioned before, extensive experience with uh, CMS integrations, dam migrations, uh, satellite digitization, rights and permissions, open access, time-based media, working groups on collections and partnership strategies. So much of that informed by my work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but also with my clients and support of BPOC in a very practical level. So if you have questions or are interested in hearing some past stories about those things later on, feel free to ask me. I'm gonna be sharing uh, some relevant links to publications that I have produced in collaboration with others and myself um, in the chat as I go along. So those might be other additional references that you can dive deeper on for more information. So keep an eye out for those. So as a 
So that test, I'll share, share my first one just right here. And if see, oh, there it is, very good, it works, that's good news. Um, take a look at that one, that's an arts data problem that I did with Jason Bailey, you might know as Art Gnome, who is uh, fascinated with AI and museum collections. Um, but now to CMSs, so um, to build off of uh, some of the great observations, especially that Jeb, uh, Jeff uh, brought out, um, thinking about the collections management system as infrastructure. It's pipes, um, it connects to so many other outputs. Um, collections and our systems are an institution's greatest asset and they are the wellspring of our cultural production, information creation, learning and revenue generation with mission to line products, programs and services. Where institutions may have been previously distracted in some cases for years uh, by the race of temporary installations, exhibitions, programs, communications and publications, uh, the impacts of our public health and safety, social and economic challenges uh, firmly demonstrate that collections are a core and they deserve our utmost attention and focus from institutional professionals and the public alike. Uh, collections management information should be considered in the context of what we at B BPOC call the GLAMS Dynamic Sustainability Platform, an organizational model developed by BPOC with an accompanying white paper that stresses the importance of a strategic approach for institutions that are adaptive, contextually relevant, and working in continuous quality improvement. Centered on an institution's mission, coincident with relationships to the economy, engagement, and the environment. And I'll share that link to the white paper so you can dive into that. So we see collections as really being part of that process as well. Uh, a CMS um, needs to think beyond the institutional myopia of the card catalog and the internal ledger. Uh, the traditional professional philosophies around the CMS are not important enough at this point to stop progress or hinder accessibility and utility for your customers and partners. This is just data, and it's not as special and exceptional as you think or your institution might think it is. I encourage you to work it out. Have real expectations about what the data can do and how interpretation can happen inside and outside of your institutional walls. But to much to Jeff's point, we also need to be thinking about building connectors that allow new voices to enter into our systems with new contributions and feedback. And an example of how that might be done is referenced in my paper from 2019 in Museums on the Web. Um, you need to think about the CMS as a critical business system. It, we can focus on pivoting to revenue generation as linked analytics and metrics with other integrated systems like social media, merchandising, and retail. So, so many of our collections management systems don't yet have rich analytics and reporting beyond static reports. But in other parts of our businesses, the expectation from boards, from directors, from department heads is having much more dynamic data and available information. And the performance of our collections are intimately tied to that. The next generation CMS solution you might find may not come from a known or traditional provider in the sector. You are not completely reliant or dependent upon those companies anymore because of the greater competition in the marketplace for database solutions broadly. Be planning for your next CMS iteration and migration now. Publishing of data externally to partnerships as well as open access can show measurable impact at scale and evidence uh, with the example of Wikimedia platforms and Internet Archive um, and some museum dashboards like the Cleveland Museum of Art and the Smithsonian. If you look at the engagement of collection images from the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Smithsonian and the Met and Wikimedia, they are in the hundreds of millions of views, which completely dwarf any kind of level of engagement on a collections online website, for example. There's also um, a need to really focus on contemporary and future formats. Um, so those would be the importance of 3D models. So we're not just talking about JPEGs and TIFFs and data sets and JSON. We're talking about a much more comprehensive landscape of media assets that are associated with those collections. Uh, in many cases, driven by retail in the marketplace who are producing products and experiences at a much faster rate than museums do traditionally. We need to think about uh, moving again, as I said, beyond to those enterprise solutions that big tech can provide. So if your institution is using a Microsoft or Amazon or Google or any other land, big, big landscape, you might find a solution right within that ecosystem that is actually gonna be lower cost and more efficient for you. And then in a broader perspective, we wanna think about collections management as integrated with enterprise content management, solutions and applications. And enterprise content management or ECM is a holistic term 
that encompasses document and web content management, search, collaboration, records management, digital asset management, and workflow management throughout the cycle uh, of content from acquisition, management, storage, and disposal. And where past collections management was thought of as a separate or independent process, it can now be understood within this larger context. And uh, this can be both at the higher systems level as a, working across your organization, but also in specific software applications. Another option that you, we haven't talked about yet today, but one that could be very beneficial for you is a headless CMS. Uh, so a headless CMS is a content management system that provides another way to author content. But instead of having your content coupled in a particular output or form or presentation layer using an API-driven workflow, it can actually be deployed with greater customization, agility, and flexibility to any number of sources. There's an urgent priority to get collections out for engagement and revenue goals, especially right now. Um, so don't think about collections as being confined to your building, your exhibitions or traditional print publications. It's really about those collaborations with uh, third party partners and solutions, especially with AR right now. There's a false belief that prioritizing collections is a choice, uh, that more budget and more time are, are available to take on the practical issues of collections management. There's not. The time to act is right now. Don't wait for grants or government funding that may not come. Take responsibility for what you can do in your own institutions and your collections future. You have to own that future. Uh, and finally, I wanna share some of my favorite best in class examples in addition to our panelists here and our guests. Um, I wanna give a special shout out to the amazing work being done by Jane Alexander, Ethan Holda, Anna Faxon at the team of the Cleveland Museum of Art. If you haven't taken a look at their collections online, their deep open access resources, I encourage you to do so. Uh, Jane and the CMA team for me are not only leaders because of the high quality of their production, but also because of they model professional character, integrity and collaboration. So I'm a huge fan, and so I want to celebrate their work. Um, for me, CMA truly sets the pace for the industry and innovation and excellence. Other important and notable examples are our friends at the Stadt Museums for Kunst in Denmark, uh, along with this, the great work that's been done at the Smithsonian Metropolitan Museum of Art, Harvard, and others. So there's a lot of great peer examples out there. Look to those peers, find inspiration from them, connect with them. And uh, I want to thank you all for your time and your interest, and uh, I look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Neil. Brilliant as always. All right, so uh, we will open up now for q and I'm just going to go through the chat real quick just to make sure that we don't miss any questions. Um, I do happen to see that Kate Gallagher had a question as far as um, uh, would speakers consider how larger institutions might be able to share their experiences slash expertise with smaller organizations? Say a museum that has one person who manages all aspects of their CMS, as well as cataloging, data entry, et cetera. Oh, I can so relate to that. <laughs> With a limited budget, would larger organizations be willing to share their data standardization protocols, perhaps by area, uh, ethnology, paper, archaeology, geology, et cetera? Uh, as mentioned, a CMS is only as good as the data, but it can be tough for one person to develop a comprehensive data standardized system slash plan while doing everything else? Or could CMS systems offer specialized data standards? Uh, and then she goes on to say, I think this is why Past Perfect has been so widely used, low cost, and it requires minimum customization to get started. Um, Alex, so. can I respond to the first one about the publishing of the, the sharing of the data? Sure, go for it. Sure. So one of the best ways I think that, I'm, and I'd love to have Jeff's response to this as well, um, that museums can help other museums in terms of that peer support is by publishing your data schema online. Um, so where you have public collections data that is public information and can be shared under an open license, publishing that schema and how to connect it and how it can be used for others, along with other great organizations like CHIN in Canada um, and the Library of Congress and the library space that make those standards widely available are super helpful to people. So the more we share um, our data schemas and structures where it's appropriate with public information uh, that's on our collections websites anyways or published in our catalogs or wall labels, that's super helpful because it shows those relationships. And Jody, it'd be great to hear from you too about how that works across the library archive and museum collections. Yeah, me too. Um, one of the things we found in our integrated collection information journey was the, the differences between standards between library archive and museum. Um, I am sure that every, every museum person on this call has, has codified data standards that they can share at the drop of a hat with anyone who asks, I do not. 
Um, it's it's been it's been pretty much seat of the pants since 1990. Um, which is in contrast to the library and archive field who are very, very regimented, very standardized, very formatted. Um, sometimes I envy that and sometimes I think, whoops, not for me. Um, so our, you know, sharing of the data, data standards with other museums probably could be done and I'd be happy to do so. I mean, I'd be happy to tell you how I catalog, but I can't necessarily put it down in a, in a um, uh, standardized format of do this, 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 and this, and you'll be fine. Um, let's see. I'm always, I'm always looking for other museums' data, data standards so that I can compare myself to them and see where I'm, where I'm ahead, where I'm fine, and where I'm falling, falling down on the job. Um, the, other, the other problem, as, as Evelyn said, or Kate said, Kate, is the, the, the differences in collection, collection materials. Every, everything's got a different standard. Everything has a different taxonomy. Everything's got a different authority. Keeping them straight and applying them is um, taxing sometimes. I'll, I'll just add, I'll just, uh, add to, 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 to what Jody and Neil, Neil had, had said in particular is like, yeah, there's no hesitation to share um share uh data standards or documentation uh i feel like the, the 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 thing that i've suffered from is finding where to put that stuff and promote it and make it visible um the the default for for us at ham is a lot of our a lot of the techie stuff just ends up on our github account uh, we have fairly extensive documentation for our api which includes um less than comprehensive uh, field by field descriptions, like what are we thinking when we put data in this field and why do we put it there? And it's just been an ongoing project in part to translate internal documentation about field use to uh, the publicly consumable version. But um, by, by all means, I, I, you know, at least from where I'm currently working, like we, we, we are happy to share any aspect of the work we're doing. Uh, whether it's uh, you know code for some of the things we build custom or um, just like what we catalog where and why we catalog it um, yeah yeah I just I would echo what Jeff said you know if anybody and some people have direct messaged me please reach out I'm more than happy to share our data standards at what we're doing at the Philadelphia Museum of Art I have done that for many many clients through um, and it, people throughout my career. Um, doing the documentation, I guess, comes easy to me because I did it while I was at the Barnes Foundation and I worked a lot with, um, at the very beginning, we had a relationship, uh, it was a grant funded, but we had a relationship with the Getty. And so I worked a lot with Aaron Coburn and who many of you know, and uh, Martha Baca. And so a lot of, you know, how I'm putting all the metadata and in the certain fields, especially in TMS, which is the collections management system I use, both at the Barnes Foundation and now at the PMA, um, is derived from that. Um, we have, as Jeff said, where do you place this information? We have um, we have a SharePoint site that is our internal is our intranet, and the collection information team has a SharePoint has a page, and on there we list the overall style guide, but then there's also like the acquisition documents. There's also the how-tos of just the basic, how do you enter a dimension? Or the other year I researched, you know, what are the correct formats for telephones numbers and emails and, and formatting. And, you know, you can get really into the nitty gritty of this. Um, but, you know, if it, it takes time and you know it, it is a lot of work 
But once you have that product, then you can hand that off to the curatorial assistant or the curator. And especially that this has been helpful with remote work. I can say, here, go to the SharePoint site, or I can just pull off the PDF and I link it to them and I send it to them and say, here's the document. It has, you know, I don't want to say it's dumbed down for anybody because I like to put images in there and said, this is what the, what the screen should look like. Here's where the data go to the next page type of situation. Um, because this is all very technical information sometimes. And until you do it over and over again, it doesn't get ingrained. Um, this morning I was checking some stuff. I'm like, is that date right? You know, I just couldn't remember. So I had to go back to the style guide myself, you know, because there's so much to, you know, take in and absorb. Um, if I may, one of the benefits that I found in when we when we uh, chose and are using this this powerful integrated content management system is that we let we let the system do the work of data stand, data standards. You know the formatting for like phone numbers is already in place. We may not like it or it may not look like what we're used to, but it's already in place. And so we, we have had to conform to the, the, the vendor's vision of collection information. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It, it frees my mind up to, to focus on other areas rather than trying to figure out, or try, rather than trying to figure out, you know, last name first, first name last, what, what system do you use? Um, I let the system, I let the system tell me what to do a lot of the time. Great. All right. So I know Steen has his hand raised and would like to contribute to the conversation in, in, in case anyone else I will, would like to contribute. I just want to let you know, we hadn't, we weren't able to see if there was a raise hand feature, but if you do happen to see one and you would like to contribute to the conversation via video, you are welcome to raise your hand and we'll call on you when the when there is time allotted. Um, so, Steen, I'll go ahead and unmute you so you can have a chance to speak. There you go. Um, thank you very much. Um, fantastic, very, very interesting conversation right now. Um, well, through the whole thing, but this one particularly. Um, I think the whole sharing and being open about the standards and the schemas um, is critical. And it's one of the things that we are, we're doing now. So I currently in this forum represent the Natural History Museum of London, and we are undergoing more or less the same as what Jody described. We are looking at the requirements and what a system for us would require and what we need to do to get a supplier. Um, that journey is currently taking us through requirement solicitation, data modeling, the whole shebang. All that information is, we are going to make that available to the community because what we are trying to do, what we're trying to enable is an agreement around standards. It's an agreement around how we share data, what the API should look like. And we hope that providing that information um, provides a, a template that others can use so that we at least don't diverge too much, uh, but we've got a, a common ground to, to work on. Um, and if anybody is interested in that, I'm just gonna put those two there. Those are the first workshops we had. Uh, and I would also like to, just lastly, just uh, Neil's comment about ECM. I think that's an absolutely um, valid and very, very strong sector that we can look into. Um, these, they, these are big sectors that work with, with large institutions and have good communities, maybe not within the natural history, um, but they're configurable. They're, they're not, we're not over customizing our solutions and end up in a situation where we can't move away from them. We are trying to uh, configure a system and make it work for us. And I think that feeds into what Jody said about the standards. Yes, we can let the, the system dictate how we should do uh, things with phone numbers and, and names, absolutely. But I've got 90 terabytes of legacy data that doesn't fit in to the 
surname, last name, or the, that just doesn't fit into it. It's got a missing date. It's got dates with Roman numerals. Um, and data migrating of that into a system that is constrained is going to be a massive headache for us, something we're looking at. Um, but definitely, we need standards, we need constraints. But how we do it is going to be uh, a challenge. But that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Steen. Um, anybody else have anything else they want to contribute on that subject? Otherwise, I'll move on to the next question. No, you good? Okay. Um, so the next question from Rupert Shepard, it looks like it's for Jeff. A CMS a director would use for business intelligence without mediation. Is that a system question or a data question? I think it's both. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I need to chew on that a little bit more. But you know, I think I think that the, the you, it's 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 uh, uh, give me a second to just like corral my thoughts there. But I think it's it's a matter of uh, right sort sort of figuring out um, figuring out in, uh, internal data standards coupled with making sure everyone understands them, um, so that they can put them to use in a meaningful way. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a fundamental underlying issue there, which is that if you don't have data, you know, I'm again thinking from the director's point of view. I'm looking, I'm looking about them oh, giving them having a holistic view across all kinds of business data, um, not just collections, but you know, you know, do donor information, uh, funding information, facilities reports, um, collections. Uh, on and on and on and on and being able to ensure that the data they're seeing is trustworthy. Um, so yeah, a lot of internal work to address like data interoperability and interconnectivity layered with standards, layered with making sure everybody at least has access to the definitions we use to describe that data. So we can, so we can have some means for, for ensuring we're all we all have actually. We all have one common lens through which to 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 put the information to use. I don't know if that really answered the question. I'm trying to making that up on the spot a bit there. Well, we can always circle back to that if there's something else that you think of or something else that comes up in the conversation that you know jogs your brain. Uh, we can move on to the next question. Um, next question is from Richard Light. Hey, Richard. Uh, Richard attended our first webinar. Uh, his question is, is there any appetite for sharing information, i.e. cross-collection search? Um, maybe Richard, if in the chat or if you could speak up, tell us what you mean by cross-collection search. Are you talking about something that's within the internal system of the organization or something that's more public facing? I was thinking um, searching across different collections um, it's a conversation we're having in the UK at the moment. There's a project called Towards a National Collection, uh, which is um, looking very much from the perspective of the sort of academic community at um, you know, the extent to which we can actually have a shared resource, uh, which encapsulates the, if you like, the entire museum holdings of the UK. You know, that would be the, the ultimate, but... Um, Certainly, when I've been talking with the users of the um, cataloging system I helped to develop, which is called Modes, which is very much smaller museums in the UK, um, I was told that there wasn't actually a massive interest from those users in being able to share records of their sort of local history museum with lots of other local history museums and being able to sort of search across that, that resource. So it's really looking out beyond the individual institution at the, the sort of sea of data that we could potentially put together. Um, and, um, you know, whether the practitioners out there actually, you know, are, are keen to do that or not. Yeah, well, I think, Richard, we can certainly look back in the early thousands to what I would call the era of the aggregators. Um, so we had the, be the beginning of Europeana in Europe. Of course, there's Art UK, which I'm sure you're familiar with. In the United States, we have uh, DPLA. 
uh, also Art Store from Ithaca as another aggregator. But the biggest and most visible places that people can actually find experience of collections are Internet Archive and Wikimedia, um, generally in terms of the largest scale, most publicly accessible platforms. So it's, the partnership with those organizations is very critical, including, I would say, uh, Creative Commons, um, to bring those to the largest possible audiences. So there is value in the aggregation of this data and, and sharing it more broadly, and that takes time. So some of the things we've seen over time is the aggregation and publishing of collections becomes more useful, but it's not immediately apparent. Um, so it takes time to build that awareness across the global context and make those estimates more usable. And the other outcome we wanna to see too is with more res less restrictive terms on how collections can be used, we see a greater output of digital art history research, data visualization. Um, the more that, the more barriers are removed from the boundaries and borders of those collections around the idea of a nation or a country or a locality mm -hmm. and are placed in the most fluid process, they can scale and grow in new directions. If, and I would just add, I mean, I think it's really important to be able to search cross collection but I think it, then it also comes back, and I'm gonna echo this, is the data standards. If your data is not clean in your own database, then it just makes it that much harder to share into somebody else's database or into a, a middle, a bridge that's going into a collaboration of all of these databases. For example, the we participated in the Google Art Project and it was really interesting to see here you have Google, but they were not following the standards of, you know, using ULAN or AAT. And so we would, you know, upload our data into their spreadsheets and it was like, okay. And then we'd get it back to look at and they would say, well, this is this way. And that, and we would have to make adjustments or say reject it because we were like, no, this is the standard. And we had the metadata in our database to say, no, this is what the, this is the preferred name. So, if you don't start with a clean database yourself, it's going to just be harder to be a contributor to all of these other databases and work collaboratively. And I think that's where we get stuck at because we all want to share and that's really, really important. But if we're not doing the work at our own house, so to speak, then it's not, we're going to have dirty data all over the place and just not really good stories <laughs> you know, or or mistruths you know or disinformation so i yeah i'll jump in here too um i think one of the one of the challenges from my perspective on you know one of the challenges in in, in contributing to union catalogs um is is keeping data fresh um you know typically or historically the union catalogs that i've Participated in, you know, they're they're looking for the they're looking for for what they would consider the immutable facts, the things that don't really change about the items, and that's that's great. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, for us, we we have two hundred and fifty thousand objects, where only a tiny fraction are well researched, so we're constantly um, improving our data and aligning it better. To our standards, like aligning our data to our, to our own standards, is just an endless project. As again, all, all of you, I'm sure, understand who deal with this stuff. Um, but there's also a nuance in here, which is that I want to make sure people of the world have access to collections and art, like period, full stop, free and open access as much as possible. Um, uh, I also want to recognize that I want, I want there to be some way, way for people to also understand that, again, these collections exist in a context and there is local character uh, that gets lost when you flatten objects out to five sets of fields, you know, five sets of standardized fields. Um, and how do you find a balance there? Uh, by presenting people with like, yeah, here's all the great art in the US or the UK or wherever around the world uh, where you can go find it, but also give people some sense of like why. Um, why, why you might want to travel halfway across the country to go some, see something because it's, again, these stories that have been built up through the ownership of it within a certain collection or, you know, some other aspect of its history 
that isn't necessarily represented by the who, what, when, and how of the art object itself. Um, so yeah, pro, pro uh, union catalog and like findability, um, but, but I have yet to see a, a catalog that really addresses some of those ideas um, or is even just trying to. And again, I understand like there are fundamental things to work out just like some core standards so every, that everyone can agree on, but um, I don't want to some of this other nuance to get lost in the mix or for people to consider edge cases because there's really no edge cases. It's all, um, it's all fuzzy. This is actually, oh, sorry, go ahead, Renee. I was just gonna, the other point that I was gonna make is, you know, we're in a time now where we're, we, you know, at least at my institution, we're like, want to expand our artist questionnaires to include more nationality, gender, questions like that. And that's all great. And, and I, I support all of that. However, when you have curators or staff and you can't even get the dimensions for an object, it's kind of like, or the date for the object, it, it kind of seems like it, it's challenging. You know, we're going to focus on all of this information about the artist, but yet at the same time, hey, the object is what we collected. And that's, and you know, so I think there needs to be a balancing act too with some of these things as well. I mean, I've had people in social media come to me and say, I would like to post out all of the Philadelphia people who have graduated. And I was like, that's great. And I love that, that we would like to post that out, but I can't tell you when somebody birth year or death year. And now you're asking me where they graduated and they're from Philadelphia. So, I mean, it, it's great information. And I, I love these ideas that people have, but if you don't have the data, like, you know, like Jeff is saying to tell these stories, then, then we can't tell the stories. So we have to go back to, let's collect the data and then we can begin to tell the stories and they have, to, and the data has to go in in a consistent way. This is actually a really good segue into the next question also from Richard. Um, is how do you record these stories in your CMS? Um, I know we had touched a little bit in our first webinar, but um, I think it's, it's a good idea to have you guys weigh in as well. Um, I know this is an ongoing issue and there is no one solution at this time, hopefully soon, but um, how do you guys go about recording those stories in your, your collections management systems at this time, at least the best that you can? Alex, I'll start on that. We already do this in many ways, so um, but it's not yet integrated into our thinking in terms of, as Jeff said, digital first. So anytime a museum um, does a wall label, does an exhibition catalog, they are creating a new version of that story. So anyone who has access to or has experience working with their collections over time, when you, when you go to your departmental library or your collections reference shelf, you can see how the stories have changed over time. But oftentimes that information is living in um, Word documents that were used to make the label, uh, the InDesign file that was used to make the book. So the collections management systems initially were built to store information about objects. But one of the most important things as we've been talking about is their context. So depending on the individual system that you have, you can probably configure um, with customizable types and forms ways of capturing those different iterations of stories and track them as how they've been deployed with the Delacroix exhibition in 2002 and the Delacroix exhibition in 2012. Um, and actually the most important thing there in terms of thinking about this holistically is that these are part of an integrated system. So when we design content, when we write content for interpretation for the public, it's also about writing things in such a way that they can be repurposed. Um, so it's having the context that's needed for that specific use, but not to the detriment of the greater usability of the text overall. Um, and so thinking about text as an asset, much like we do the underlying uh, factual data, as well as media assets, is I think a, a much improved area of thinking that we need for the sector as a whole. Yeah, I can, I can comment a little bit about what we're doing specifically. Um, and it, again, dovetails with what Neil, Neil just said, um, I, I, I guess one, again, broad statement is, or, or question for everyone to think about is, is, is what, what is a st story? Just period. Um, you know, it's not where it's not just words printed on pages in a, in a, in a book, uh, a story 
is seeing an item in context. And that might be in the context of a plain old exhibition record in your CMS and its publication history and other, other activities that are logged in there showing it's showing, you know, the arc of the item's life. Um, how has it been portrayed alongside other items um, can be gleaned from, from exhibition history if you are, you know, so inclined to catalog that kind of thing. And as, and depending on how granular you get, you know, like some of the early visual, visualization stuff that I've tinkered with, our collection was literally taking some of our highlight objects and looking at all of the other items in our collection that they were listed as part of exhibition history records and just showing, you know, a, a comparative view of like how many times a particular painting was showed, shown alongside, you know, other prints or paintings or, or whatnot. And that in itself is, is a story to be unpacked. It's not a story in its own, but um, can yield further uh, questions and, and produce further insight. Um, but we are, you know, we, uh, again, to Neil's point, we have PDFs of our wall labels. The wall labels get transcribed rather slowly into texts, blobs, you know, into our, our CMS. They get republished back out into our API and they're visible on our website. Uh, we have label history there that will, again, show how various authors have talked about a particular object over its, you know, 20, 30, 40 year lifespan. Um, but I think maybe the most important thing we're doing right now is that we aren't necessarily incorporating the, the body of the stories that are being told, but we are capturing the existence of the stories in, on external resources. You know, our, our database is getting more and more chock full of links to, out, to things out on the web. We have an online magazine that has its own CMS for authoring those articles. But, you know, we, 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 uh, we have publication history that nods to that. We have publication history entries that nod to special collections or what we would consider digital publications on our website, videos out on social channels, what have you. Um, you know, our objects that are up on our Google Arts and culture page, I'll have the URLs pointing out there to show them in different contexts. So it's, it's for us right now, it's more about making sure we are capturing the pointers to where those stories are. Again, recognizing like the ephemerality of the internet um, and the instability. Uh, we're also, I think, a bit measured about where we allow our objects to appear on the internet, measuring, you know, what do we think is the stability of that existence? Um, and how does that fit in with our mindset of like wanting to preserve everything, but at the same time providing access now? Um, again, sort of a fuzzy answer, but we do have a lot of URLs in our database. We do have text and, you know, pointers out to other kinds of multimedia assets that we republish in different ways, um, either directly to, to our API and then on our public website. And uh, it's it's an ongoing conversation. If 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 I could respond a little bit too, um, listening to you all talk um, is fabulous and great and aspirational because I realize that that if you were to put what I'm doing on the scale of what you all are doing, I'm pretty much using a stone tablet and a chisel at this point. So one of the things we do here in Iowa is, is to simply add the story behind the object to the object description. It's, it's just words on a page that does get uploaded to the online portal. So uh, names and dates are included in that object description. So if anybody's searching for a great grandmother, whomever, um, chances are they will pull up that record. If, if, if everything is spelled correctly. Um, thanks, Jeff. Um, I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not, you know, 21st century in any way, shape, or form, but it is simply a way to park information and, and connect it to the object and let people find it and find the story and read the story and maybe contribute. We get a lot of crowdsourcing of, hey, I see you've got this object connected with this person. That was my great grandfather, here's his story. I cut and paste that into the object description and we have more than we had yesterday.
Great. All right. Um, we have about 15 minutes left, so hopefully we can try and fit in another question or two. Um, it looks like the next question I have is from Valerie Kincaid, who is on our, our first panel. Um, and this is, it looks like more directed towards Renee. She wants to know how AI can help us with disparities, that, the disparities that you mentioned in um, one of your responses. Valerie, if you want to, I can unmute you if you want to elaborate on that. <laughs> Just a moment. There we go. So I think what I'm talking about is, um, if we're talking about that we don't have clean data, we're talking about also crowdsourcing our data, and we're talking about all these ways to bring in these stories and that kind of thing, I think that we need to go down the path of looking at AI and seeing how AI can, can help us with that homogenization. I mean, what we're really talking about, I think, is in the larger context of trying to catalog the human experience here through the material culture that the people produce and the, the natural objects of our world. So if we're looking at it that broadly, you know, we need to find what, what is that AI tool that's being developed out there or is it out there already that can, 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 inve can infest our data, let's call it infestation because that's what it is, and, and pull those disparate pieces out and how can we teach it to, to put those things in a place where it really promotes the interpretation um, of, of our world. So, um, you know, Renee, Neil, Jeff, <laughs> Jody, any, any um, you know, things that you see out there that we, can, that we can maybe pull into this, because that's what we're really talking about. You know, not being so concerned about our data, data's not clean, let's find a tool that will clean it. Yeah, I know that, so I, I don't see Ginny Choi on this call, um, so I'm gonna speak <laughs> around the edges, so to speak. Ginny did a presentation with several other people at the 2019 um, MCN conference about how they did some AI for tagging their objects at the Mets collection. And one of the things that she talked about, she gave some examples of how some of it really worked and how some of it didn't. So a great example is, you know, it was a painting that had children in it and the children had, were wearing dresses. Well, just because they had dresses on, they weren't all girls. It was, you know, that was the era of the 17th or 18th century that all children wore that. So the people who were doing the tagging just assumed these are girls, you know, so, or, so she said there was a lot of cleaning up that they would have to go back and do. So I don't have any personal experience with that. I just know from listening into that session, that's, that's what she shared. Um, I think there are some basic things that we can do, like if it's just even attaching straight object names, you know, just writing a description is a hard thing to do. But if you can at least say, this is a cup, this is a table, this is a chair, then that would help then with the AI process. Um, or if you're trying to identify colors, are we using, you know, a standard color palette that, you know, because everybody's shade of blue is going to be a little different or if the or if somebody's looking at it and they're colorblind or you know so what can we do to make it easy like start with those i i go back to and, and i feel like i say this over and over again like start with those foundational things the easy things and then you just keep building up and then then you're going to have then that bright shiny thing that the executive leadership wants but if you don't start with the foundation doing those bright shiny things is is really difficult and challenging. And it always feels then like you're doing another one-off project. Oh, here we go again. We're spending all of this time and we're on just these 20 objects as opposed to doing, making sure everything has a bare minimum. Yeah, that's, I'll just uh, jump from Renee there. Um, so when I was working at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a lot of what I did for a period of years was what we called uh, internally local collections, which was satellite digitization. And so uh, working with the collections information team, digital asset team, and the imaging department, 
we created basic standards for digitization. Um, we brought the, we irised in on a very tight number of triggers and data points that connected to an automated workflow. So that, that connected across the capture workflow for digitization, even in a storeroom. So it was not a fancy setup. It was a very rudimentary setup just to capture that basic object record that was good is good enough for the collection online. And the file was captured at a decent size enough that it could be reproduced for teaching purposes or education on the web or publication. And then we, we took advantage of the fact that that relationship existed between the CMS and the DAM so that we didn't have to copy that data over. We were just making that relationship connected. And those two data points, the, the object ID and the uh, capture information um, automatically triggered the digitization workflow all the way through the beginning of the creation of that assets lifecycle, that object's lifecycle, all the way through to the publication output. So there are key ways to automate and batch process significant numbers of materials if you restrict the criteria that define what a record is to start with and knowing that that work is going to be ongoing. So that's a, a key point in terms of mass digitization. When I started at the Met, I used to have the slide of the museum's first website on my desk and then we digitized that. And we started with 50 highlight jobs X. And by the time that I finished my time there over about over a decade, we had 350,000 records um, from our former collection of estimated to be 1.2 million, 1.5 million. No one, no one even knows yet to date. So, and that was with a, it was a, more about the collaboration of the people working together to solve that problem and a smart use of technology systems than it was just about the standards guidelines alone. Great. Um, I think we have a little bit of time left for one more question. Um, I know this is this is related to what we were just talking about in regards to digitization. Um, Steen asks, can the supply meet the demand? Um, and then I, I think he adds on to his question after that, does the demand for the data and its uses not grow with the data available? And Steen, if you want to expand on that, I can unmute you as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's just a, it's a question because we, we, do, we do extensive digitization of our collections and part of it is because only 10% of it is used. We have 80 million or so objects and nobody really knows what's actually in there and we've got multiple specimens of the same species. So the question is, the more we digitize, the more data we put out there, the more data points are available to do analytics and AI and create data sets. So what we're creating is we are creating an ever-growing demand for more data by creating data. And it's not a problem. It's, it was just a question because there is a reason to digitize is to make that collections data available for the things that we wouldn't think people would use it for. Um, but that of course then creates a growing demand. Um, now, I appreciate that I might be coming from a different sector, not the, the, the arts where you might have smaller collections and potentially could digitize a full collection from an artist, for example. Um, we have endless data and we're never going to finish. Um, we have something like 490 years just to do our current collection with a sizable staff. And within that, we would have increased our collections twofold just by our collecting efforts. So we're in a never ending cycle. So it was just a comment on, on what, if data comes before digitization or, or whether they just sort of just ride hand in hand. It's a, it's a really interesting, I'm just gonna jump in here. It's a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting thought uh, and point that you raise. And, and yeah, I mean, my first reaction is, yeah, like again, I'm very much in the art, art museum mindset. So the uniqueness of each item is pretty apparent and inherent. And as a collecting institution, if we are making some great claims that this is, you know, we collect the things that we feel are important for the world to know about, um, then, I, then it's an imperative for us to make that data available for people to, 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 for us to back up our claims, you know, to be like, yeah, the stuff we have is important and you should see it. Like we shouldn't keep it in a dark, room uh, it's totally uh, you know antithetical to our our mission um but i could understand yeah different types of collecting institutions grappling with that that notion is it is kind of what leads the efforts to this the supply demand is there is again is there some correlation there uh and i don't have an answer 
answer for you other than like if if part of the overarching grand mission of of human existence is to make human exist the 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 the, the record of human existence available to all humans currently existing then digitization is a is an imperative regardless of what your collections are <laughs> uh that's a bit of a i don't know anyway well said jeff well said some rain so yeah <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, just i just to, to join in, join in the chorus there with Steen and Jeff on on the importance of that. Yes, yeah, so again, let's you know as we're getting close to finishing up here today, think about our current context and time. And I just want to make a special um, signal of support for you and all of your institutions to support open educational resources or OERs. There may be uh, students and teachers in your community, both you know throughout the the level of education that they're at, that are currently dependent on your institutions as resources for learning, um, which would include things like commercial use because you don't know how the publishing process may work. So if you think about your collections as an integral open educational resource too, you are serving a market need, but especially for students and teachers that may have been able to physically come to your institution in the past, they may not be able to currently do that. And the impact and scalability of that um, for education, which is a mission at the, the heart of many of archives, libraries, and museum institutions, uh, think about the importance of that, that OER impact uh, now and going forward and how you can scale that up with, with, with the data you're doing. Excellent. Well, uh, let's wrap this up. Um, thank you. Big, big, big thank you to our panelists today for your contributions and for everyone contributing in the chat. Steen, Richard, for and Valerie for contributing on video as well. Um, this has been an amazing discussion again. Um, and I know we didn't get to all the questions, but with that said, we will be doing more webinars as part of this series. Uh, we're looking at our next one revolving more specifically around the technology of collections management systems. So if you are interested in participating in that webinar as a panelist or just you know, part of the discussion, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm gonna put my email in the chat. Um, otherwise, we will have a recording link and transcri a transcription of this webinar. Um, Hopefully I will have, available, have it available to everybody at the end of this week. Um, but we will share that out back on the listservs that we promoted this webinar series on, our social media platforms, and YouTube as well. Um, thank you again, everybody. Again, I'm going to put my email in the chat. And then we will wrap this up. All right. Take care, stay safe, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.